Welcome to the SAG After Foundations Conversations at Home program. I'm Jazz Tanke, Senior Artisans Editor at Variety. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the cast of the Righteous Gemstones. With us, we have Danny McBride, Edie Patterson, and Adam Devine. Hello and Hello. welcome. Hey, what's up? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here virtually with you all. But I just want to go back. Like, what was it like? I, I felt like it was the longest hiatus between season one and season two. This is a thing called the pandemic. But like, what was it like for you to be back on set the first day for season two, even though you're probably shooting season three as we Zoom? Uh it was, it was, I mean, it was incredible. I thought for sure one of us was going to come back 350 pounds. Uh, but no, we all came in regular sized, the same size we left the show. Uh, I, was, I was very impressed that, uh, that we were able to do that. But it, it was great to finally be back. Yeah. I would have I would have come back 300 pounds heavier, but all the restaurants were closed in Charleston. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. the only reason why. Yeah. I, by the time we came back, I felt wild, like in a good way. I felt like, ugh, like I couldn't, I couldn't wait. I couldn't yeah. wait. Yeah. It was, a, it was a lot of, because, you know, I, since I started actually acting, and that, that was the longest break in between like things that I've done. And so it was a lot of, uh, am I going to be able to memorize lines again? Like, did my brain break over that like year and some change that we didn't shoot the show? <laughs> it did. Yeah. To answer that question. Yeah. You pulled I was it very off. dumb for the first month or so. <laughs> but Danny, you know, you wear multiple hats on this. Not only are you the writer and you act in it too, you're also the series creator. Take us right back. Like, where did the idea for this crazy show begin? And I say crazy with love. Uh, you know what? I really, I wanted to, after doing Vice Principals and getting to work with like Edie and Walton and, you know, Busy and Kimberly and uh, Georgia, all these great actors, actresses, I really, I wanted to do an ensemble. I wanted that ability to kind of like tell a story and just be able to showcase a bunch of really talented, funny people. And I was just looking for an in for that. And I moved down to Charleston, South Carolina, I guess in around 2017. And I grew up going to church. And I went all the time. And uh, and I guess when I got back down to Charleston, it just got me thinking about my child and about church again. There's so many churches in South Carolina. I mean, everywhere you turn, there's a church. Uh, they're on every you know, religious stations on every other dial on the radio. And uh, religion is a big part of people's lives uh, down here. And it, I don't know, it just got me curious of what church was like now. It had been so long since I'd been. And that's when I started seeing these mega churches. And it just uh, instantly something started to kick that like that sort of concept of a pastor who sees themselves as like bigger than the word of God. And, and they see themselves as like a celebrity. It felt very much in line with like the other sort of characters that Jody Hill and David Green and I have explored before. And there was something about about the setup that just felt right to sort of tell a family story. And so that that was that was sort of the impetus for it was just trying to find an ensemble and trying to find a world that felt like it was going to be fun to explore. Yeah. And you have the best cast and best ensemble. Um, Edie, talk, talk, I mean, I love all the characters. Edie, talk about, you know, playing Judy and like developing her now that, you know, we're going, we've, just had two seasons of her like yeah what is it like living with this character and working with Danny to you know to take her to the next I guess step um it's it's the greatest it's um one of the greatest gifts of my entire life is being Judy and Danny having created her for me and saying like this is who I want you to be on this show and then having the, um, the, the awesome creative freedom to sort of run downfield as fast as I can as Judy is just, um, it's, it's just absolutely joyful and a blast. It's the greatest. And I, I love her. I think she is doing her very best in life. And I think that everything in Judy is uh, in all of us. It's just turned up a little bit. 
and um, there's not a there's not a screen door blocking her feelings from coming out. Yeah, how much collaboration goes on between you know all of you and, and like or like the two of you to talk about the characters and where they're going or like ideas that you might have to you know to help to step into her shoes more. Well, I think that there's a, a ton of back and forth, uh, uh, especially because I'm in the mix of writing the show. And so um, we, yeah, we communicate a lot about Judy and uh, Danny is, you know, not to get too weird because he's right here. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And um, when, when he's got a, a cool idea, it, it resonates in me immediately and immediately makes me laugh. And luckily, um, if I've got an idea that's right on, he, it makes him laugh too. We, we, we can crack each other up, which is such a gift. And um, I feel like I can go to him with any idea and go, hey, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe this is right. And uh, he, he's a, such a good North Star on that stuff of going like, yeah, go for it, or let's wait on that, or, um, yeah, he's, a, he's an incredibly bright uh, guide, guidepost. Yeah, I love that. Adam, what about for you, and playing Kelvin, and I he's don't such like a- working with Danny, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the time to get it off my chest. This is it. This no, incredible, I- unique character. I... Uh, I mean, it was incredible. I, I, I've said it before, but uh, Danny is really, and once again, he's right here. Uh, I'll be right back. Yeah, <laughs> take a break, go to the bathroom, do something. <laughs> but he really is on my Mount Rushmore of comedy heroes and somebody that I've looked up to. And one of the first people that I saw that spoke the same kind of language that me and my friends did when we were creating comedy, when I was you know, 20 years old when I first started to get into it. And I was like, oh, those guys talk like how we talk. It doesn't need to be something else. Uh, And really inspiring. So when he asked me to do the show, it was obviously, I had, you know, I I had to come on board. What a genius idea the show was just in general. And then what the writers and Danny and, and everyone in the writer's room, including Edie, uh, have done with Kelvin. It's, it's just such a, a blessing to get to play this character. Uh, and from doing this show, I say things like blessing now. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> that I'm in the lexicon. Speak to him. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in. I drank the Kool-Aid. Um, but I, it, it, it really is. And there's no, there's no better word uh, than blessing because I feel every, every day I get that I'm on set, it's, uh, it feels pretty unreal and I pinch myself that I get to work with people like Danny and Edie and John and, and then, I mean, the rest of our cast, the, the whole list is, are all home run hitters. And that's another thing that I think Danny and David and Jody did so well is they really cast the show with just home run hitters, just everyone, uh, everybody, you, you don't, you're never fearful of anyone, uh, that they're not going to crush any scene that they're given. And I, they, he did a great job with the casting uh, top to bottom. I, yeah, I'm so happy to be a small part of the cast. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing what happens, you know, next with Kelvin, but it'd be criminal to not talk about the music, like talk about weaving the music into the show and, you know, how these incredible lyrics come together. I mean, who can forget misbehaving from, you know, what was that episode five, I think, but like that exploded on the internet. Like just, yeah. Talk about the, the, the right being in the writer's room and coming up with these ideas. You know, it was something that was kind of funny because, you know, music has always been integral to all the stuff that we've made from Eastbound to Vice Principals. Uh, we have like really, you know, I remember before I wrote Vice Principals, I was Joey Stevens and DeVoe Yates, who uh, who kind of are the mastermind behind a lot of our music. 
you know, I'll bring those guys into the process, like both while I'm writing of like, this is the, the idea, this is the vibe. I think because the show goes in so many different tones, um, the music is sort of the guidepost to the audience to sort of understand where they're supposed to kind of be emotionally or, or what sort of, oh, they're supposed to be scared or like, it just helps to keep the train on the tracks. And you know, we knew that this was a family doing a mega church that they were going to be performing and singing. And I feel like it was something, though, that Edie, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the beginning when we were writing, I was barely thinking about that, you know, and it wasn't until we were deeper in the season and we started thinking about this misbehaving song of like, oh, I guess we're going to have to see that. Like, I guess it's going to have to be more than just like uh, an album cover in a house or like in a script. Like, what are the lyrics to that? Like, what is that? You know, and and once we started kind of cracking into that, it just opened the whole world up in such a fun way because then it was, you know, one thing we always wanted to make sure with the gemstones is that like, they're actually good at what they do. Like it would be sort of not realistic if they were terrible ministers and they had an empire this big. So even when it came down to making something like Misbehaven, we want to sell their mother, Amy Lee, like she was a star. So the song has to slap. It has to feel like something legitimately that people would have been into. And, uh, you know, Edie and I were just kind of bullshitting on it. Uh, you know, we kind of realized, like, oh, we're going to have to see this song. We just started spitballing back and forth for literally, I think it was like two minutes. And then had wrote down a big chunk of uh of lyrics and then I used my phone and Edie sang the lyrics into the phone and then we sent it off to Joey Stevens our composer and within like an hour and a half he had like completed the lyrics put it to music and sent it back to us and it came together so sort of fast and instantly I think we all sort of just got it it was like oh this like this feels so right and you know I've never messed around with writing any music before but I love the instant like gratification of that day, you know, like so many times we'll spend all this time writing these scripts and before you get any reaction from it, it's like months later. And it was really cool to be in that room with Edie writing these things together, just making each other laugh and then seeing like a created piece of art, like, you know, two hours later, it was nuts. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a weird thing I think can happen with, um, with writing songs that, is different than writing dialogue in that it can just start to this can happen with dialogue too but with a song it can be so fast and it can sort of go like in front of you in neon it's just there and you go like oh my god there it is but danny had said something like um i think you said those first couple lyrics danny you were like something like oh tell me not to i did it anyway and i was like oh like that <laughs> and that like sparked something in my head. And then we got on to these other verses about the pies in the windowsill and torn in the crick. And like, we we're like, oh, right. It's about bad things kids do in the country. And like, we, we knew the vibe of that, whatever genre that is, we knew that, oh, it's a bad kids in the country song. <laughs> 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 and like, weirdly, the melody was just there. Like I sang the melody into Danny's phone. We sent it to Joey and then he added amazing lyrics now did you think of running around the house with the pickle in my mouth yeah, in the moment not, or did was that it. sort of a gift from god and you woke up <laughs> in a, in a, a straight in a up set? yeah that's a straight up channeling gift from god <laughs> through the mind of joey <laughs> <laughs> uh, another episode is is the baptism thing which edie you wrote that up i mean it again we have to talk about that but how much yeah, we, fun we uh yeah we kind of all get our hands on all of it but danny's also heavily involved in writing that one and also john cherry and yeah how much fun was that to write and then just execute the whole episode i think i was i had laughed the lines the whole time and it was like there's no like cream in the world to remove them now but man it was doing that episode was so so great and even um even the writing of it was a really fun and uh almost different type of thing in that almost the whole episode happens at that baptism yeah there's there's some stuff that we catch up on beforehand but it was that amazing luxury of like okay now let's go look at these people okay now let's see what this idiot's up to okay now let's see which is my favorite thing in life i mean i could i could watch and participate in hours and hours and hours of that kind of thing. I just love watching people be. Um, 
And it was weirdly just like technically a huge luxury to be in that place for an entire week and a half. It almost felt like, uh, you know how Vegas can feel uh, weirdly cozy? <laughs> like if it's, if it's a gorgeous enough hotel, it can almost yes. feel like, you know what, there's slot machines going off everywhere, but I would love to take a nap in this bar. <laughs> I'm at home here. <laughs> yeah, that's what that baptism room felt like. The church felt like um, baptism in space, like in, inside an iPod. The, the yeah. baptism room, though, was so weirdly sexy and cozy, but yeah, I loved every minute of being in there. Oh my gosh, I love that. Adam, what is it like for you every day when you go onto set and you walk into wardrobe? Obviously, I'm talking about Kelvin's like incredible fashion sense. Um, and like, this is what he's wearing today. Like, how much say do you have in Kelvin's wardrobe? Uh... None, none. <laughs> Sarah tells me exactly what I'm wearing. <laughs> and I'm like, there's more lion heads on it. There's more bedazzled lion heads. Okay. Lion heads. All right. I guess there's lion heads all over this one. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. The, and admittedly, like usually at the beginning of each season, I'm like, is this too far? And then when I watch the seasons back, uh, at, you know, after everything's said and done, and I'll, I'll, I usually watch the entire season before I go back to work just to fully immerse myself uh, in it again. And I'm like, I have to dress like this. This is Kelvin. He's just a maniac. He has to dress like this. I don't care how uncomfortable it is to wear this, this like ascot in the middle of August in, in Charleston. It's this is how Kelvin dresses. So, uh, it's such a blessing to uh, Sarah Trost, our, our uh, costume designer. She, it's such a blessing to like get laughs before you say or do anything. <laughs> like from turning around and uh, just this outfit, people are already like, "Yes!" <laughs> so it it, it, uh, it takes a lot of heat off of uh, my acting. <laughs> I'd you, say you, we you all get a fair amount too. of. Oh, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Yeah, what did you say, Danny? Wonderful. I said he pulls it off too. We actually have like conversations when we are presented with those costumes of like, is it too much? And then everyone's like, Divine can pull it off, actually. He, pull it off. Like, he, he really knows how to work a leopard print beret. <laughs> he gets what? constant, um, full, like, full of, uh, full of love ooze from me. Like, yeah. Ew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like your little cat that's peeking his head around, just seeing what's I up. I know. Yeah. <laughs> she wants to be part of this conversation. Clearly, she loves the yeah. Righteous Gender The hairless cat is a big fan. Hello. Yeah, it's a big fan. <laughs> um, I was going to say, in ter- what is it like on set? Like, you know, in terms of like, here's the script, but how much room is there for improv? Talk about those moments. You know, there's though we we have sort of like no rhyme or reason to any of it. You know, when we when we would do Eastbound and Down, we would like rarely like shoot the script. You know what I mean? We would get there and then you wouldn't even get through one take. We we would finish the scene. Like, did we ever get what was written? You know, and it would kind of like it was all about just riffing. And we did more of it. We, you know, in Vice Principles, we riff, but not as much. And in this one, it's like Edie and Adam are so good at, you know, at improv that like anything they want to say, they can say and they can do. Uh, The thing that's been trickier about this one, I think, is because there's so many characters, a lot of times in the structure of the scripts, like scenes have to move and you have to get in and out of stuff. So I feel like me personally, I probably improv the least amount I have on any of the other shows that I've done. But anytime that we get those moments where it feels right, whether it's you know, at church lunch, or a lot of times it's when us three are together, I feel like we'll start jamming a lot, you know, but uh, it's one of those things where the, uh, there's so many spinning plates. I feel like sometimes I don't do it as much as we've done it on the past, but it's good to know that when you want to do it, you have people around you that can crush it. Well, I also feel like the scripts are so tight and so well-written and we are telling a, a a whole story uh so it's it, it you you really have to like cherry pick your moments 
and all the improv has to be additive and pushing the story along. And so I feel that that's why the, the three of us, I think when, when it's us together, I think there's a little more freedom because just the dynamic of the siblings together, we can just kind of shit on each other and make fun of each other and say things <laughs> like bye Felicia and walk through fountains. <laughs> <laughs> The, you know, the one of the cool things, like what Adam was saying earlier about the past and the whole past being kind of a murderer's row, home one hitters, and like that's that's one awesome thing, um, especially with these two dudes, but with the whole cast in general, is that no one is trying to do uh, the type of improvising that is like, hey, listen to this funny thing I thought of eight minutes ago. Everyone's, if any improv occurs, People are just being in the moment in their character and it's a more organic type of improv rather than like here's a joke here's a joke here's a joke here's a funny thing it's a it's a very nice like very real everyone's just i'm just being judy Danny's just being jesse i'm just being kelvin and new things may pop up but it's just us being these people it really comes in handy when we do those church lunch scenes because, you know, you have every character in the show around the table. And if in the writer's room, if you sit there and try to make a line for every single character, the scene suddenly is like 10 pages long. So uh, we, we sort of like the those table scenes end up being where we riff the most. And it's kind of like uh, it's needed, like in order for that to feel like it's family and it feels like they're so comfortable around each other. You kind of want that thing of people stepping on each other's lines or someone says something or makes a look and someone else doesn't let it fly and they call them out on it. Like, and that's that type of thing where if you try to script out all those little moments, you can kind of get lost in the woods and it kind of just ends up coming out in a really natural, fun way that I think brings those table scenes to life because it feels like you are just watching these people eat lunch and talk shit to each other, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And you brought up, by the by Felicia moment. I mean, how does something like that come, like what conversations, it's the greatest use of by Felicia on TV. <laughs> and I remember seeing that on my timeline so many times, but talk about like how something like that came up. Uh, Whose idea was it? I don't know. Was that, was that scripted? It might have been scripted yeah. and then yeah, all the improvs around okay. it. And then it was like stepped out how many times you said it. And then like our reaction of like, wait, who's Felicia? Are you calling me Felicia? All that I think was, was uh, improvised at the end. And I think I like asked if you wanted to go get snow cones or something yeah. like yeah. some bizarre just like a thing that I I feel like a a brother and sister would know that they each love snow cones and it's totally. like a, a, a sweet treat for them to go get I don't know but yeah, uh, like, Jesse's also so uncool that I felt like that would be something he would reference and think was like a deep dig and a burn and, yeah. and then it just made me laugh thinking that it would upset Judy like that she would be really upset about that about uh -huh. <laughs> like it just gets into childish banter of just these adults acting like complete idiots yeah um I you know I can live with the righteous gemstones this whole family for years like Danny talk about like how far like you would love to you know like if you've planned out like ideas for them down the road like how far in advance have you you know i think i have i have a general idea of what i'd like to see it all add up to but you know it's it's all it's like a season by season deal kind of you know like you learn something every you know <clears throat> what we set out to do at the beginning of season two and then what we finished at the end of season two like we learned stuff about the show we learned stuff about these characters and the growth and the things that these uh, these actors bring to the table and how it ends up informing things. So it's kind of nice to have like a subtle guide of where you hope it lands, but being open to the it evolving season to season and really seeing like what new things are these actors going to bring to the table that wasn't expected and, and what stuff is interesting that I want to see more of next season. So a little bit of it is like having a plan, but a lot of it is sort of being present enough to like look around you and see what's working and see what's making Adam excited or Edie excited and trying to push the show into directions that allows them to flex those muscles more. 
Yeah. Why do you think the gemstones, like people love, like this, this family, chaotic as they are and hilarious, why do they resonate so much with the audience? Like, what is your answer to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. With all the characters that we've centered shows around before, we always sort of end up like choosing someone that traditionally would be a villain, you know, and then it's like sort of like trying to find that path of empathy for the audience to sort of like, well, even though they suck, I like them because of this. And so with this, I feel like it's their love for each other. Ultimately, that's like relatable, you know, and uh they suffered a tragedy like right before the series begins. And in a way it's it sort of like, it doesn't excuse all the behavior, but it helps you understand it a little bit more. And I think that people, you know, humans are, are pretty empathetic people, you know, when we want to be. And I think that you can empathize with even the worst among us when it starts to become about matters of the heart or matters of like loss or yearning or longing or wanting to be accepted. It's easy to see yourself and uh, I don't know, it's easier to see yourself in others when you start identifying those things. Yeah, yeah I think they, sorry, go ahead, Edie. Oh, sorry, Adam. Um, I think there's a thing that, I think as humans, we like to watch other humans that are um, trying their best and screwing up all the time, but still trying their best and still, uh, still going forward with, uh, with love and a desire to do the right thing, even if they don't do the right thing over and over and over and over. I think it's fun to watch that. Yeah, I, I weirdly think the like people relate to the family. Like even even though it's obviously we're more childish than a regular family would be, or we're we're probably wouldn't react to the exact same way with your sibling in real life as these characters do. But you still relate. You still do to a small degree. And you're like, you know, I do wish I could throw a steak at my brother-in-law or you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like whatever. You're like, yeah, I've been close. I've been close. And the gemstones just just do it. Just let it fly. And I think it's really fun to, to watch. And I think that they, they do relate to that. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I love that. And, you know, the series, I cannot wait for season three. And I, you know, it's just the best. If you're not watching it, tune in because, you know, the Gemstones are one of the best families on TV. And so on behalf of the sag After Foundation, I want to say thank you for sharing your experience, your process and your craft with your fellow performers. And thank you so much for that conversation. Yes. Thanks for having us on. You're welcome. Thank you.